So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third Make Your Mark Knowledge Share mini conference, Natural Heritage Volunteering for All. Today we are joined by BSL interpreters. Oh, sorry, I just that's cut out for some reason. Today we are joined by BSL interpreters Sharon Elder and Donna Jewell. If you would like BSL interpretation throughout the event, then simply right click on each person and we've enabled multi-pin for you. Um, and that will keep the interpreters visible at all times on your screen. And then um, there's a bar on the side that will allow the visibles, uh, the interpreters to be either larger or smaller, depending on what your needs are. So climate change and biodiversity loss has been increasingly brought to our attention, but COP26 has accelerated awareness and the nature is in crisis and there is a climate emergency. As a society, we need to work together to embrace the shifts in behavior that affect us all. We understand the emergency in different ways and must respect and support each other with our differing needs and skills. And so all speakers today will be talking about their approach to ensuring their volunteer makes an impact for natural heritage while being inclusive for a range of participants. There's a real opportunity to turn the volunteering response into one of the solutions this event has been designed to inspire, educate and connect volunteer managers together. So it's really great to see you all today. So my name is Rosie Wiley and I'm from Historic Environment Scotland and I'm also Vice Chair of Make Your Mark and will be your chair for this session. On behalf of the organising committee, I want to say a big thank you to you all, all of our speakers, workshop presenters and panel members and of course to all of you who have signed up to be part of this knowledge share discussion today. This event is brought to you by a partnership between Make Your Mark and the Heritage Volunteer Group and is hosted by Historic Environment Scotland's Community Connections Forum. These are a collaboration of organisations coming together who all share the same aspiration of supporting volunteer involving organisations. And if you want to be part of this and you've not signed up to Make Your Mark, please do so at the end of the event and we'll be giving more information about Make Your Mark as we progress. Make Your Mark is a campaign that aims to increase the number and diversity of volunteers in Scotland who love our built, natural and intangible heritage. Our goal is to encourage the heritage sector to take the lead on all inclusive volunteering practices and experiences. We currently have 77 organisations signed up and it's growing all the time. But before we do hear from our first speaker, a quick few housekeeping rules. We're in a Zoom meeting space, so hopefully that will enable you all to formally and fully participate in the discussions. But please do keep your mics off unless you're speaking, and hopefully that can give us a smooth running order. Cameras are completely optional. You might find if you're a bit unstable with your connection, turning your um, camera off can help. Now we're going to be doing Q and A's and a proper panel session later on in the agenda. So. Um, Please do put any questions in the chat during the presentations and we'll just be scanning it and then you can unmute, read the question out yourself or I'll read that out on your behalf. So please um, do let us know if you're happy to unmute. Now, digital hands, use them or wave if you need to, but also please use the expressions button and the reactions. So let's have a little practice now. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen and you'll see all the little icons along the bottom and there's a wee smiley face with a plus that says reactions. So let's all have a wee shot, find some reactions. I'm gonna go for a love heart. So let's try and make the screen a colorful one. What else? Celebration, here we all are today. Oh, Audrey's surprised, clapping hands. So please do use your reactions throughout the event. So I know I don't need to say this, but please be kind and respectful when you ask questions and respect each other as we take part in the discussion. Really want to make sure that this is a lovely, friendly, inclusive nature of the event. And we want to continue these on and online and have lots of you back. So our break will be at 10 past 11. And Jess has asked that you have a notepad and pen ready for her workshop. So we're tweeting, our event hashtag is hashtag make your mark Scott and all of this information will be popped in the chat. So time to pass over to our first speaker who is Christian from RSPB. So Christian's current role is a volunteering development officer with RSPB Scotland, supporting volunteering across Scotland, but with a focus on helping North Scotland teams with volunteering development. He's worked in volunteer coordination for five years at Sockton Park in Edinburgh and Northumberland for the Coast Care Partnership with Northumberland Wildlife Trust and Northumberland Coast AONB. 
Sorry, Christian, I do not know what that stands for. So I will pass over to Christian, who's going to get started with our first presentation. Oh, you're on mute, Christian. Five pounds in the mute jar. Unmute. It was going to happen. <laughs> can everybody see the slides there? If I can just get a thumbs up from somebody in the audience. Yep, we can see them. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, Rosie. And AONV stands for Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Um, so, yes, uh, my name is Christian Purchase. I'm a volunteer and development officer with RSPB Scotland. Uh, my uh, pronouns are he, him. Um, so the RSPB is one of Europe's largest nature conservation charities, and there are more than 12,000 fantastic volunteers across the organization, and between them they contribute almost 1 million hours every year. The RSPB residential volunteering scheme began in the late 1970s, and there are currently 48 residential volunteering uh, sites across England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and of course, Scotland. It's a great opportunity to help with conservation work, gain practical and people engagement experience, meet new people, explore new areas, take a holiday in nature or use spare time while being active in the outdoors. In Scotland, the current youngest age someone can apply for residential volunteering opportunities is from the age of 18. Overseas applicants that hold a valid visa can apply with some additional provisions required. Residential volunteering with the RSPB is split into two main categories, long-term residential and short-term residential. These uh, short-term residentials are typically four weeks or under. Uh, some sites may decide to run short-term stays. They're often referred to as working holidays, residential work groups, or residential work parties. Long-term volunteers are resident long-term residential volunteers are uh, roles that last typically from two to 12 months depending on the site and the volunteer these roles have a four week trial period residential volunteering is often considered a pathway into careers conservation careers in conservation at a recent staff gathering it was fantastic to see how many colleagues began their conservation careers and journeys with the rspb after residential volunteering opportunities and how that has shaped their experience of volunteering volunteer management and support for residential volunteers so I'm sure plenty of folk working in volunteering have heard something along the lines of not being able to afford to volunteer. With residential volunteering opportunities for the RSPB, accommodation costs are covered for short and long-term residential volunteers, but it is the responsibility of the volunteer to cover the cost of their transport to and from the reserve, as well as cover the cost of their food during their stay. Transport whilst volunteering on activities is provided, Training provided for all volunteers, training is provided for all volunteers, although long-term residential volunteers with specific role requirements are provided with further training opportunities that are role-related. Role-related personal protective equipment, uniform and equipment, uh, and further equipment is also provided. Volunteers can claim universal credit during their stay as a source of funding. Islands and rural sites are isolated and tricky to access by public transport. Having a clear contact for advertised roles is a great way to help to have a knowledgeable and honest conversation about the site and look at ways of supporting access to the site and the role. Although this may not resolve the barrier in many cases, it can be a helpful and more personable way to engage with interesting people, with interested people and can highlight where a site could do more for volunteers or direct people to more accessible opportunities. How opportunities are advertised and recruited can be a bar barrier to residential volunteering as well. Consider how roles are written. Is prior experience actually required if training will be provided on site? Using case studies or volunteer stories alongside role advertisements can be a great way to encourage volunteers and can convey what can be gained from residential volunteering as well as the real volunteer experience. Remote interviews are a great way to meet and engage with volunteer applicants applying for long-term residential roles. References are required during the application process, which could deter some applicants, but clearly signposting a contact to speak to uh, staff members or individuals about the role before applying can really help prospective volunteers find out more about the site and the role. Using platforms like Make Your Mark, social media, as well as engaging directly with universities and colleges can help direct opportunities clearly to people and groups that may not have considered or known about residential volunteering opportunities previously. 
So I'm going to talk a wee bit about um, using co-design to identify some of the barriers we've just spoken of. I've just spoken about them now, but we used uh, earlier this year, we began working with some of the residential volunteers on an opportunity for them to develop their skills in project work through co-design. And it was a great chance for us as volunteer coordinators and their line managers to look at identifying barriers from the perspective of volunteers and so look at developing more inclusive residential opportunities. It's a bit dry the next couple of slides, um, but I will whiz through co-design. I know it's a, a term that might not many people, not everybody will uh, know of. Um, so co-design is a design-led process that uses creative methods to encourage and engage a wide range of people to take part. There's no standard step-by-step -step process, but instead a set of principles to be applied to a project. There are immediate and long-term benefits to the, uh, to the co-design approach. So for us, we sessions were coordinated and designed by colleagues in the Scotland, RSPB Scotland Education Families and Youth Team who have experience in setting up and co-design projects in various fabulous youth projects in Scotland. Um, a group of residential volunteers from three residential sites in Scotland were invited to take part with support from their volunteer line managers. Scotland Volunteer Development Officers, as well as the UK Residential Volunteer and Development Officer, were also there to help and support the volunteers. In the first session, introduced the concept of co-design with icebreaker exercises. The groups explored motivations and challenges that could be encountered by typical and non-typical volunteer personas that they developed, which, they, which led them to identify uh, barriers and how they could be overcome. The next session led with identifying motivations, experiences and desired outcomes from their own time as volunteers. The volunteers then suggested methods of communication and arranged them into groups that might have more impact and reach with non-typical volunteers. The following session was refining target audiences and how they could be reached. They developed a communication project brief to target a young audience. So their project brief was that they developed was a new film that would uh, do the role justice, show different aspects of residential volunteering, showing the, the career, the fun, the searching for wildlife, one or two minutes to capture the experience that could be hosted online and also play on the loop at, at careers fairs and could be combined with existing footage. It needed to show, it would be need to show estate management work, tree work, bird surveying, hands-on work, wanting with a desire to be more include show more inclusivity and show the importance of residential volunteering and what you can gain going forward in those roles. So for us, we're now at a co-production stage where the residential volunteers are recording footage for the film and we'll be working with some guidance and support from volunteers in the media and communication team to edit and produce the film. The project, co-design project has been a brilliant learning experience and has developed so many ideas for us. Uh, with some more confidence in leading and approaching it, we could invite and include more residential volunteers and run this regularly to keep it relevant um, and allow for more volunteers to take part and develop their skills. We could even look to engage directly with underrepresented groups to co-design more inclusive roles for them. Supporting ro residential ro volunteers in our um, residential settings is really important. These sites are often quite isolated locations and not all are well served by public transport or have easily reached local amenities. Residential volunteers stay on sites after working hours and share accommodation together with people they are often meeting for the very first time. In shared accommodation, it's important to ensure that volunteers agree together on a setup to maintain these areas. Audits are a really good way to keep on top of decent living standards with reporting processes for any repairs or replacements in place between audits. Obviously, there may be times when not everybody may get along, so it really helps if volunteer line managers keep regular contact and encourage safe space discussion for any issues or grievances that residential volunteers may have. Wellbeing support and resources are available for all, our, all staff and volunteers in the workplace, which is fantastic and it is important to signpost and maintain the accessibility of these resources. A mental health first aider support list is great and is often available, uh, is readily available, um, and it's especially useful if staff on site are trained in health, uh, mental health first aid. There can sometimes be occasions where a volunteer may be alone on site between other residential stays. These can be particularly isolating and more regular one to ones and working with the wider team is good practice to keep them involved and feel comfortable. 
Many long-term residential volunteers may feel like they have to be on site all the time or use every minute of their stay to make the most of the opportunity. This can easily lead to burnout. So volunteers are encouraged to use holiday. Some sites have capacity to host visitors, maybe a partner or a family member or another friend and visits or holiday breaks are encouraged for the volunteers to take if they and those visits or holiday breaks are encouraged for volunteers to take if there are instances where they could be alone on site for a period of time. Including volunteers in whole team meetings on site and site communications really helps with their development and involvement in on site activities. As part of the wider RSPB, there are many internal advocacy and support groups that are open to staff and volunteers. LGBTQIA plus groups, neurodiversity groups, women's groups and more are very, very active with channel with communication channels and meetings and are a great way for staff and volunteers alike to meet and socialise while working remotely. For long term residential placements, training opportunities are provided that are role relevant both internally through workshops, uh, events and training courses and licensed skill courses externally. Conducting regular one to ones with line managers allows opportunity for the volunteers to acquire about further training opportunities they might identify or even other skills or interests they might like to offer to the team. It's not uncommon for residential volunteers to volunteer in additional roles during their stays. If the volunteers are using their time to gain career experience, it's really supported to help direct volunteers to any roles or opportunities that may come available. And also really good to try and run practice interviews or provide feedback on CVs or applications as part of their uh, volunteer development. Uh, you're allowing them to uh, access uh, advice from a recruiter's perspective if you're chatting with them about this sort of stuff. We encourage teams to share when they are running training so that residential volunteers may be able to join other sites and visit them if they weren't able to visit otherwise and socialize with other residential volunteers in other teams. So looking a wee bit at the challenges now and for the future of residential volunteering, through the first lockdowns and coronavirus restrictions in 2020, residential volunteering ceased at RSPB. Both teams that manage manage residential volunteers and the people that volunteers are um, and people that volunteer are reassessing things. Like so much of the workplace, new normals are being developed, and there are new challenges being faced that can really highlight existing barriers. There's some discussion around how residential roles are titled, for instance. In turn, is sometimes used, but. Uh, can be considered a, a, a controversial role title by some. Following feedback from previous residential volunteers at RSPB, intern has been used as a role title at some sites for long-term res residential roles lasting uh, over six months, as it was considered a more understood and respected role title for CVs and applications. The cost of living crisis is raising, raising questions. Could shorter length opportunities be more inclusive? Would, but on, on conversely, would teams buy into a higher turnover of volunteers and could volunteers leave just at the point that they have settled into a working rhythm on site? What about funding for further support for residential volunteers, looking more into food stipends, support bursaries for underrepresented groups as well? While volunteers can claim benefits uh, while on volunteering, while volunteering at residential sites, there are conditions that are required to be met and it can depend on the individual officer assigned to the volunteer, how volunteering meets the conditions on receiving those benefits like universal credit. And also the future of the benefit system um, may not be enough of a resource to support um, some volunteers from applying or continuing in a long-term role. With residential volunteering given a frontline experience of conservation, the public urgency to engage in practical conservation, more people looking to change careers and the cost of living crisis impacting on people's budgets, there could actually be a reverse and an increase in interest in residential volunteering. The opportunities could be viewed as low cost or affordable holidays, as good taster sessions for taster uh, opportunities for people looking for a career change or a way to compensate for missed outdoor opportunities during the lockdown years of the coronavirus pandemic. As a pathway into conservation, um, it's really important that there's uh, a visible representation in volunteering um, for underrepresented groups working in the environment sector. Um, encouraging and recording volunteer stories and case studies from uh, underrepresented groups and publishing them can be a straightforward step towards visible representations within existing structures within your volunteering setups. Like so many in the volunteer sector, we're very much still working on the journey towards inclusivity to, to, to better inclusivity. 
So it's great to have the chance to share experiences and challenges we face with residential volunteering and learn with others how to support better inclusivity for volunteers and teams they work with. Thanks so much for your time. And if there's any questions that any team anybody might have, I may have run over time, so apologies. It's OK, don't worry. Um, there certainly is some questions for you that have been coming through in the chat. Now, I am interested in co-design approach um, and anything that you might do differently next time. There's also a question about a link for more info about the co-design. Fantastic. I've got um, several links for co-design that I can put into the chat um, after after this and share them with everybody if that's if that's great for people. Yeah. Yeah, I um, think that that that'd be a good way because I'm just I'm conscious of time. So I think, yeah, if you if you put more info about the co-design in the chat, that'd be great. Um, uh, Debbie was asking, Deborah Wilson, who is also a member of Make Your Mark Volunteer Organizers Network joining us today. Hi, Debbie. Um, and she was asking, is there a range of ages that participate in the programs? Yeah, so we do we do get a real range of um, volunteers participating. We tend to find that um older uh, the older audiences have participated more in the short term volunteering opportunities in the past, um, but that that's, doesn't discount long term volunteering as well. We do have a really broad range of opportunities in England um, and I think Wales as well. There are um, younger the age range can actually be as low as 16 for some sites, but there's additional safeguarding training and safeguarding practice that is in place there um, that isn't. Um, possible currently at some of the Scottish sites that would be something that would be really good to look into in the future um, but we've got a really broad engagement um, historically it's a little bit different now in the new normal um, but I think we'll, we'll look at how we can you know keep in people of all ages involved. Okay, great. And then we've also got questions from Jess and Holly. So I think what I'll do is, um, Jess, you said you'll read yours out. So if you can come off mute and read yours out. And Holly, just um, because of time, Christian, if you're happy to respond to Holly's one via the chat, um, just um, during the next speaker, that'd be great. Okay, Jess. Thanks, Amy, and thanks so much, Christian. Um, that was a really interesting talk. I just wondered if you get many um, repeat residential volunteers or if it's usually approached by both them and your teams as more of a one-off opportunity. Obviously, there's huge benefit for repeat volunteers. You know that they love it. You, you know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. So how do you balance requests for repeat or extended roles with ensuring a fair opportunity for all applications? Brilliant question, Jess. Um, so we do, we do get a lot of um, uh, repeat vol residential volunteers. So quite often, um, especially for short term residential volunteering, we get the same people coming back year after year, or they do, they, they quite like to tick off different sites, um, which is really good. And it's great to have feedback. And uh, it's a good way for teams to find out how other teams are working across the UK. So that's fabulous with that sort of stuff. For longer term residential roles as well, we definitely get um, uh, questions and, and queries from volunteers that have signed up for maybe um, a couple of months and they've gone do you know what I'm really enjoying this I'd like to extend my stay um, quite often they uh, will be encouraged to look for opportunities especially if they're trying to develop a career in conservation they'll be um, uh, forwarded on to other teams a lot oh, of residential yeah. volunteers apply for multiple um, sites, so they can actually be a bit of a competition between teams, and there, there can be some <laughs> disappointment at times. Go, oh, curses! We've missed out on that volunteer. We were yeah, really hoping yeah. for that one. So it's uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you, and thank you so much, Christian, for that um, presentation. Really, really great. And yeah, let's get a bit of chat going on. So. We are conscious as an event team that uh, there's always a wee bit of fatigue with digital events. We've all been in this space for a, a couple of years. So we like to just keep everybody awake and live. So we have a quiz, part one of our three part quiz peppered in amongst today's programme. So I'm going to pass over to Audrey Wilson, fellow event team member and Make Your Mark member. Audrey is from the Scottish Council on Archives and will be our quiz host. Hi, yeah. Um, my name is Audrey Wilson and I work for the Scottish Council and Archives and today we are pleased to bring you a quiz to test your knowledge of Scotland's wildlife. Uh, the images and sounds come from the Ascent Field Club Archive and they record and document a great number of wildlife sightings every year. 
For those that may not know, Assent is situated in the northwest corner of the Highlands of Scotland, which has some of our country's wildest and most remote mountain and coastal scenery. So just to let you know how to play the quiz, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to offer you some different answers. You'll hear a few seconds of wildlife sound, and then you can select your answer on a poll that will appear on your screen. Hover your cursor over the options and press enter. Have we got the first question? Rosie, great. So this is the first one. Which one of these insects cannot or will not sting you? Is it A, the common carder bee? Is it B, heather mining bee? C, the tree wasp? Or D, the white-tailed bumblebee? Can you see the poll? <laughs> oh, and here's the sound, sorry. Did you hear the sound? Sorry, I've maybe you interrupted. Want to play the sound again? Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's a great. Oh. Oh. Here it comes in. Here it comes in. Did you know, actually, just while we're waiting, there's 115 species of bees that have been recorded in Scotland, but not all are bumblebees. Anyway, I did not know that fact. You didn't know that one. Just know. that's. Um, I think, do we have, oh, it's quite close, actually. It's quite close, but actually, you're right. Um, I think the, uh, the greatest number of you have answered B, and that is correct. It is the heather mining B is the correct answer. Um, they're known as solitary bees, just to let you know. Oh, that's it on again. <laughs> That's it on again. But they're actually not. They do work in a collective hive and they produce offspring that carry out different tasks in the same way um, as honeybees, for instance. So great. We're going to have another question before we go back to the presentations. Um, and this one is, these are images and sounds. I've still got the poll from question one on my screen. Hang on, I better get rid of that, everyone. So this one is, um, these are images and signs of a cuckoo. Which unique strategy does it have for rearing its young? There's going to be three options here. Is it only the male incubates the eggs? Is it B, it lays its eggs in the nests of other species? Or C, it buries its eggs so as to keep them warm enough so they can hatch on their own? So three options here. Oh, I think maybe people know the answer to this. I can, maybe not, maybe not, maybe that's the wrong answer. Okay, absolutely right. It lays its eggs in the nests of other species. Yes, and it just takes, just as a matter of interest, a cuckoo young hatch just after 12 days, and then they immediately proceed to eject the host's eggs and or chicks out of the nest, thereby ensuring its adoptive parents give all the food to it. Thanks. There you go. Lovely. Thank you, Audrey. I need to ask, was that a picture of a cuckoo on the screen before? Yes. Was it? Oh, yes, was I know. Quite the trees. Oh, there you go. Sorry, Sorry about that. Yeah, There's yeah. There's a reason I'm not a park ranger anymore. OK, so our next speaker is, um, well, we have three speakers, actually, from the conservation volunteers who will be talking to us about the TCV building roots um, and other TCB-led inclusive nature-based volunteering. So we're joined by Julia, Laura and Ali. Julia is a business development manager with TCV Scotland with a particular focus on equality, diversity and inclusion in conservation volunteering. Laura is based in Ayrshire and studied zoology at University of Aberdeen. She's been working with TCB for just over a year now and is a senior project officer for the Building Roots Project in Ayrshire. Ali arrived in Scotland as a Syrian refugee in 2018 and is a project officer with TCB. He helps Laura develop the Building Roots Ayrshire programme. So I shall pass over to TCB. Yeah, I don't know who's supposed to start. Uh, <laughs> Hello, I think it's Julia is sharing your screen just now. Now we can no. hear you, Julia. Um, it's coming through very fractured. So I don't know if Laura or Ali, do you want to take over from Julia just while we're checking that? 
Yeah, well, I can give myself a little bit of an introduction. So um, I'm the senior project officer for the Building Roots project in Ayrshire. Um, and we've been running outdoor sessions since January 2022. And um, so the Building Roots project, um, we run in three different areas in Ayrshire, in north, south and east. And we work with um, local councils um, in partnership with local councils. and. We work closely with um, ESOL tutors to run sessions for uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And the aim of the project is to tackle social isolation and anyone that's a newcomer to Scotland is bound to feel very isolated, especially if it's a very different culture to what they're used to. So <clears throat> what we, like to do with our outdoor sessions is we run nature-based activities um, that also include English language learning and encourage um, speaking in English to um, help people practice their English speaking skills as well as their um, some vocabulary that they will um, uh, that's to do with Scottish nature and it's a great opportunity for loads of people to come together from different countries and practice their English as well as enjoy themselves and get to know other people that are new to Scotland. And Ali is the project assistant and he's from Syria and he helps with Arabic translation as well as Kurdish translation. So Ali, would you like to say anything about the project? Yeah, um, uh, I'm a project assistant. I think you introduced me as a project officer. Um, so I, I help in Kurdish and Arabic interpretations. Um, we meet people and like we tell them, uh, I think um, what we do is, is a bit different than like uh, than what they get. Uh, I mean, English wise from an ASL, from an ASL class. Um, we get, we, we have, we, we've got the chance to tell them about nature, to show them the be beautiful side of the nature in here in Scotland, but also um, they have the chance to practice their English with us, uh, the English that they cannot find in ESO classes or maybe um, in, in books, because like while they are with us, I mean, refugees and asylum seekers, uh, they are in contact with with us, uh, with Laura, with the other, other groups of asylum seekers, like, I mean, from other countries, and also uh, our ASL teachers. Uh, the way we speak is, is not like, um, it's, it's, it's not like very formal. So the way we speak, the way we chat in, in our sessions is, uh, is, is very helpful to, to, to our volunteers rather than like, I mean, compared to rigid um, grammar and ASL classes. So they come to our classes because they first they enjoy nature and second they have a chance that they might uh, not be able to practice their English in ESOL classes. So I think these are the two elements that attract our our volunteers. Yeah, for sure. So some of the feedback that we've had is that um, they they feel that they're so we've um, got a lot of people from. Um, Syria from Ukraine. <clears throat> Ukrainians probably make up about half of the sessions now that we run. Um, so in East Ayrshire in particular, we run it in a central location in Kilmarnock. Um, we run it in, in Kay Park and we have on average maybe 15, 20 people attending each of the sessions in East Ayrshire now. Um, and it's a great opportunity for them to mix with people that are from different countries and they feel that they don't have to worry about being judged when it comes to their accent when it comes to pronunciation if they're trying to learn English so they come out of the sessions feeling very fulfilled and confident to use the English that they've learned during sessions and some of the activities that we run um, are things like um, we do building we've we've built nest boxes we've built insect hotels and we've done things like shelter building as well as sketching and mindfulness sessions and we try to incorporate a lot of um 
Scottish nature into that. So just teaching people about what sort of things they can expect to see when they go out and about. So maybe um, bird spotting walks, that sort of thing. And in our sessions, we're also working towards our John Muir Award. So to help with um, adding to their CV. So we've been working closely with Greener Communities, which is a part of East Ayrshire Council. And we're working towards the management of the park in Kilmarnock. So we've been planting wildflower seed beds outside the Burns Monument Centre, which is a, um, a registry office. So the, it's there's a lot of pictures taken outside the Burns Monument Centre, as well as um, yeah, it's just something that they can take pride in. And we've also done some flower planting and we do uh, nature walks where they can learn some of the terminology when it comes to the nature in the park. So that's something we're working towards at the moment is the John Muir Award. And most of them have achieved 25 hours of volunteering experience. So they'll be getting their certificate at the end of the month. Um, yeah. I just quickly, so we, we just had a wee bit of chat going on in the background. So I think Julia's having tech issues, unfortunately. So Rosie Black is going to screen share. Um, mm -hmm. So Laura and Ali, if you um, just carry on the presentation, maybe skip through the bits of the presentation that you've already talked about in terms of the introduction and the project overview, if that's OK. Mm. I think um, yeah. just because uh, Julia's all... Um, with the funding, she's the main part of this the presentation, mm -hmm. so... Can I just check and see if you can hear me? Hey, oh, yes, you you can hear you. Hey. <laughs> oh, so I'm so relieved. I just I just made a slight adjustment on the settings and and uh, and I don't know why that's happened or why it switches itself off, but some something's happened because it was working fine this morning. So oh, I am so great. sorry. Laura, Laura will back me up that she and I were talking <laughs> this morning and it, everything <laughs> was fine, and now of course it isn't. I, I feel so bad about that. It's I'm so sorry. Way. Um, I think what we might do, and just conscious of people might be wondering that we're coming on after it time wise. So, um, Audrey, I think what we might do with with part two of the quiz, if we do part two of the quiz during the break time, so folk who who fancy the, that. So, Julia, that gives you a bit more time. So please um, keep going um, until um, about ten to if that's OK. That's absolutely fine. And and Rosie, because I can't see you now, which is totally fine. Um, just um just button. Uh, okay. If I, <laughs> I'll let if you I, know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so so really, so just yeah, I'll I'll try and whiz through the slides. Um, is it Joanna or Rosie that's but that's falling on? So just um, yeah, if you just go on to the first slide, I'll try and whiz through some of them that are. Uh, more kind of funding related and get on to, I mean, Laura's covered the end of our presentation at the beginning because of my technical problem. And um, one of the things that comes up around working with um, with groups that are, I guess, harder to reach is funding. So I just thought I would touch on that, which is a bit of a dry topic. What I will say, because time is short, is that um, I'm really happy to speak to anyone about the funding side of things because um, we have quite a lot of experience and quite a lot of success around that and I'm really happy to share our approach um, so I can condense what I was going to say into into a few sentences which is really that we we um, because uh, everything we do is is user informed so through consultation through asking the people that we're wanting to work with what they would like and, and everything some of our projects start quite small so our funding pots are, are, are quite small so I'm, what I'll do is I'll, I'll whiz through but you can see or you can make a note of some of the funds that I'm putting up um, on these slides so um, if you just go on to the next one and just if, if there's any that jump out at you just you know um, just give me a shout later on if you, if you want to ask a question about any of them um, and on to the next one sorry so and the, and the one after that this is where I was like oh I just need to whiz through one, one of the main things about um, working with refugees, um, I suppose, is that we need to address the barriers to inclusion right at the start. And we do know what what they are. Um, and I put a few a few things up there around, you know, I don't know anyone. I don't know where to go. I'm new to this country. I don't have any transport. I don't have any money. Um, my confidence is low. And it's all these very, very basic concepts that our projects try and address, as Laura mentioned earlier. So. 
um, because we we have a good understanding of of the kind of difficulties people have, we try through our funding programs to make sure that we can address some of those. We can't address everything, but things like transport, things like um, interpretation, and um, people you know in involving people from the community that we're um, targeting is a really good way of just being able to kind of hit the ground running. Um, if you go on to the next slide, I think there's more in that. So it's, I've got a few things on here, which are, it's really all incredibly um, basic stuff, you know, around assume nothing, ask lots of questions. Don't be frightened to ask questions if there's something that you're um, not sure about in terms of working with a, a, a group that you, that's new to your organization. Find things in common, find it, work out what and, and do activities where there is a common ground. So that's likely to be uh, around food or outdoor cooking, um, about celebration, about um, children, families. Um, so there's a whole host of different activities that we run where we find common ground between people. So it's kind of bringing people together. Uh, provide transport, it's gonna be an issue. Work out how you can reimburse expenses. And if you don't have that in house, then you need to find funding for that. Um, be ready to adapt. So, you know, uh, our weather, we all know our weather is a massive challenge to, to a lot of people that are new to the country. So we, you know, TCV, we go out and we do stuff all the time. People think we're really weird. We are weird. Um, you know, and it is a case of trying to adapt to our session. Sometimes we have to go inside. Sometimes it's outside. Uh, sometimes we have a fire. And all of these things are, you know, great sort of memory makers. So it's about a lot of what we're doing is about creating a shared experience that is memorable for people to talk about you know what about that time we went out with tcv in the rain um so it, it's 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 just kind of thinking ahead to those things that are going to be a challenge for people making sure there's access to a toilet making sure the paths are accessible by prams um rosie you and i worked together years ago on, on all of this and and we had a whole conversation about dogs you know i remember that conversation really well about um dogs can be quite frightening and quite uh, intimidating and, and we love our dogs in this country um, but in, in other countries of origin, they can be a huge issue. And, and one thing I remember learning very early on is that if a dog um, saliva touches your robe, um, if you're uh, practicing Muslim, your clothes, I mean, um, you have to go and wash. You have to go and wash your clothes. And that's really inconvenient if you're out shopping. Um, and so that, you know, that is something else like I had no idea. So there's a, there's a whole host of things that are really handy to know um, that that stop us building up um, kind of like innate sort of prejudices about what people think, how they dress, how everything. So, so you can see I'm kind of rushing through trying to keep to time. So that I can't remember what's on the next slide now. If you move it on, that would be great. Uh, so yeah, just keep 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 going. So we we were very fortunate to get some funding from the Heritage Lottery uh, three times. So we started with two small projects, which were called Welcome Through Wildlife, and moved into, if you move on, um, into a, a, a bigger, a bigger um, application across seven local authority areas. So that was um, right across the central belt. Um, and that allowed us to really explore the whole um, building routes um, program and work with a whole range of different families um, I think there were, I can't remember, I want to say 200 people in total over two years. Um, and that led into Laura's project. So where before it was all about introductions to nature, we worked with HES, National Trust, RSPB, we worked with a massive amount of kind of environmental partners. Um, but it was baby steps. It was, you know, it was like, how do I get out the front door? How do I get, how do I find out where, where to go? What's close to me? We, we had a whole host of projects for teenagers, for older women, and um, for young mums under 21 with toddlers. Um, we ran a cycling project for um, teenage girls who didn't know how to ride a bike. So there's a whole host of different projects. And, and brilliantly, if you forward on a couple of slides, I can introduce Roba, who is a little bit close. Oh, we ran a brilliant, a brilliant residential on Aaron, actually, um, which I don't need to talk about too much, but it was an exciting project. And, and then at, at the end of our first year, we, we uh, were able to um, employ Roba, um, like Ali, from Syria and a refugee. 
um, and she was interpreting for us for quite a while. So she was a, a real, um, you know, linchpin to success in the terms of her understanding her community, speaking the language. And we use WhatsApp groups to uh, reach out to the community uh, that we were working with. Um, and Roba then is still a member of staff. So she's been with us for, I think, three years um, and is still, you know, building this kind of area of work for us, which is absolutely um, brilliant. She was supposed to be with us today, but she has an appointment with a lawyer, so she couldn't make it. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I think we're getting closer to the end. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, oh, just a little bit about consultation and, and tasters. And, and this is just, you know, us trying to be creative um, around um, how we get information from our uh, kind of service users and, and uh, participants. Um, and that was particularly for the Ayrshire project that Laura is now delivering. So next slide, I think we're nearly there. So that, yeah, so on to, I think, I don't know, Laura, if there's anything else you wanted to say about your project, because you thankfully stepped in at the start. <laughs> um, no, just some of the main successes have, have definitely been the, um, the social aspect. So we have a lot of coffee breaks where people are able to just chat and the, the coffee breaks have lasted longer and longer. So it's that's one of the main successes. But what, what we found challenging is just making sure people are able to get to site. So in, in the next couple of slides, we've got a few pictures of the project, I think at the end of if you're able to, there you go. So um, these are some of the visits that we've made. So we, we went to Dean Castle Country Park and we had um, a, a walk that was led by the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And we also, um, the picture at the top right, that's from the Burns Monument Centre. So we, we talked about Robert Burns and we read out some poetry. Um, and on the next slide, I think, yeah, there, here there's some more pictures. So we had a, an, a huge event, which was outdoor cooking, which is something that they've absolutely loved. Outdoor cooking is such a social thing and sharing food. And we had an event for Refugee Festival Scotland um, in June, which was open to the public. And it was a huge success. We had quite a lot of people there. And it was yeah it was the social aspect of it was was phenomenal so yeah I think that's when it comes to getting a group like this started it helps to have a plan uh, of I, I did a plan of two months of sessions that were themed and some associated vocabulary that could be useful in ESOL classes um transport is something that's quite difficult so we try to stick to a central location that's very easy to walk to that is not far from um where all of our learners are are living so it's familiar and it's comfortable for them to come every week to that same location um and ali helps a lot with um translating resources so when it comes to health and safety it helps to have translated resources for things like that so yeah I think that's everything when it comes to how to get I would say that. and just fi finally that we are working on a, a, a another funding application so obviously it comes back to funding which is really annoying but um we're growing the Laura's project and Laura and Ali's project model across the central belt and into Northern Ireland so that's a project that we're working on at the moment we're looking for partners uh, for that project um, and if anyone else is thinking about this kind of area of work that might be an opportunity for them to do some sort of taster sessions or to get involved with us if that is something that anybody is interested in we'd, we'd welcome um, you know new partners and the and talking really about the central belt so from Ayrshire so Glasgow, Stirling, Falkirk, Grangemouth across to Edinburgh those are the kind of centres because that's where TCV centres are so um, and, and Belfast of course but uh, if, that, if anyone wants to be involved, then, then just uh, give Laura and I a, and Ali a shout. Great. OK, thank you so much, Julia, Ali and Laura. And actually, um, where you're talking there about new partners, so towards the end of the event, I'm going to be talking about um, some funded workshops. We've been lucky enough to secure some support and funding from the Scottish Government linked to the Volunteering for All Action Plan. 
about heritage and non-heritage organisations partnering up in a kind of workshop context. So I wonder, Julia, if TCV, that might be something that you're interested in. Um, but as I say, we'll, we'll be covering more of that later on in the event. So we don't actually have um, any direct questions for you at the moment coming through into the chat. Lots of compliments and um, possible links and such. So I think what we'll do is because there isn't any questions at the moment, we'll keep going. But Ali, Julia and Duncan are, and Laura, um, sorry, I've say, called you by your second name there, Julia, Duncan, Julia and Laura <laughs> will be joining us on the panel. So any questions for TCV, then um, please do keep them for the panel. So we are going to um, have our second part of the quiz at the start of the break, okay, just so that everyone does get the uh, time for tea break, that we need those all important screen breaks. So we're going to move on to Able to Adventure, who are our next speakers, and it's Gemma from Able to Adventure talking about approaches and adaptions to create inclusive outdoor opportunities for all ages and abilities. So Gemma is the operations manager for Able to Adventure, a mobile disability adventure organization in the Cairngorms National Park. She's been working in disability adventures since 2008, where she worked for the Ben Rigg Trust. Able to adventure provide activities from canoeing to climbing for all ages and abilities, usually specialist equipment and approaches. So I will pass over to Gemma. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see uh, the presentation. So I will just get that up for you now. All right. Just bringing it up for you. Can everybody see that? Can you give me a thumbs up just so I can be sure that you can see it? Yep, we can see that. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, so just to yeah, explain a little bit more about myself. Thanks for the introduction, Rosie. Um, Able to Adventure or a mobile outdoor activity uh, CIC up in the Cairngorms um, and we've been here for about three years working in the Cairngorms. Um, the background is that I used to work at Bendrig Trust which is a disability outdoor centre in the Lake District and it was designed specifically for all abilities so everything the climbing wall, um, the building, um, the catering, the accommodation was designed to make sure everybody can access it and that's where I learned about different approaches um, and equipment that you can use to help to get people outside. So we now use um, similar equipment, um, but because we're mobile, we can go to different locations um, in the natural environment and meet people there and take them out on activities. And the range can be anything from canoeing to guided wheelchair walks um, to volunteering opportunities. We use volunteers a lot ourselves um, because we generally find that we need a few more hands to help on sessions. And so this is one of the things that comes with the approaches to being inclusive is that you might find it's beneficial to have a few more people about, perhaps just to explain what's been communicated. It might be simply to offer an elbow so that somebody can hold onto your arm while you're walking to the location. Um, or it could be help pushing a wheelchair. So we tend to find like one member of staff um, is not quite enough for a session. So we have a key lead instructor or guide, and then um, we have a few volunteers that will help support people on the session. And obviously speaking to the individuals, you'd be able to figure out what support it is they need. And they'll tell you specifically, oh, I, I like to hold an elbow as I walk, or um, I prefer to hold your rucksack um, and that will help guide me to the location. So we've been involved with a few learning awards uh, in the area because we're in the Cairngorms. Um, we've been to the Abernethy Reserve a few times and uh, done the John Muir Award uh, in, the, in the Cairngorms National Park and worked with Cairngorms Connect on that. Um, and that was to a group of homeschooled young people. Um, a lot of our opportunities are reactions to the community. So we're very much led by um, disabled individuals themselves. So we'll have conversations and then they'll they'll mention something that they'd like to do. Um, an example of this would be last Saturday we ran the first wheelchair adventure race in the UK 
And for that adventure race, we had people coming from all over the UK, uh, came up to the Cairngorms, lots of different types of chairs and hand cycles, and uh, they blasted around on the tracks, um, seven kilometers. Um, and that came from them. So we were led by them. And I think that's one of the key things with, with being inclusive for all abilities is making sure that we're listening to people um, and reacting to, to their needs. So I'll move on. Um, so this is one of the volunteering opportunities that, that we've led. Um, I actually love this picture because it says a lot more about the group and what was happening. And I'll explain that in a minute. But these are homeschooled um, young people. They're all autistic, some diagnosed, some undiagnosed, but they've found the school environment has unfortunately not worked for them. So the parents have had to react to that and create opportunities outside of the school. And they told us they're interested in doing the John Moore Awards. So we thought, right, well, we'll set that up for you and we'll, we'll figure out um, what you'd like to do as part of that award. So they chose a bunch of activities to explore the area um, and they were very much into looking at different types of fungi and different types of uh, birds in the area. They were all really keen to go to Loch Garten and go to the visitor centre. However, to make this an inclusive opportunity, we ran sessions beforehand to talk about any barriers or any concerns they might have about doing the award. And one of the big things that came up was that the visitor centre could be really busy and they don't deal well with uh, large numbers of people. Um, so what could we do about that? So we spoke to, um, to RSPB at Abernethy and they were really good at explaining, actually, you know, the visitor centre shuts, I think it was October, um, but we can bring you in, we're still there working, so we can create a time slot and you can come in and explore the visitor centre um, by yourselves. So we were fully supported for the young people and I could reassure them that this was going to be possible. And then we went in and they absolutely loved it because they could explore in their own time. They didn't feel anxious um, or uh, concerned about anything while we were there at the visitor centre. So that worked really well and it set them up for the rest of the award. They then knew they were going to be meeting Cairngorms Connect at the tree nursery at um, Abernethy. And we, we had to make sure we gave them all the information in advance, so exactly what day, exactly the time. When it got close enough, two days before, I gave them an idea of the weather um, so they knew what to expect in terms of their clothing. I told them who we would be meeting um, and that really helped them knowing how many people they would see that day. And they thoroughly enjoyed that time actually at the, uh, the tree nursery. So we had some volunteering time there. And then the next session, they knew they were going to be walking up higher into the hills to see where um, the saplings would be planted um, further along their lifeline. So they really enjoyed knowing all of this information. But the thing with them is we have to be very reactive and the picture in the corner was towards the end of the, uh, the tree planting. And uh, they were asking lots of very, very detailed questions about the trees, the exact numbers. Um, and then I think one of them is very, very concerned about climate change. Um, and he started to feel quite emotional um, and was really struggling with just thinking of a bigger picture of climate change and what was happening to the environment. And um, I could see who was starting to be triggered. So we, we stopped and one of their favorite games is to play camouflage. So we went off into the forest um, and started playing camouflage. And then they asked for a photo and I said, okay, we'll get a photo. And they went, we don't want our faces. It's like, okay, we don't have to have our faces. We can turn around. So, um, you know, we turned with our backs um, and then somebody pointed out, oh, we could make a really good rainbow. So then they got, quite into organising all the colours here uh, in this photo. So that was part of the process for them. And uh, it just helped create a safe space and a calm space for them. Um, so this is just an example of how we react to make sessions inclusive. So this was uh, led by them this moment on their, their volunteering. And uh, I love that photo because I know how much effort they put into organising our colours. <laughs> all right. Okay, so. Um, these are just some things about planning sessions and opportunities uh, for volunteering in nature. Um, because we go out all the time, a lot of these things are kind of inbuilt into us, but if you were starting from scratch, 
Um, it's just thinking about those sessions that you're offering. So the first one here is um, the particular venue that you're meeting at and if there's any facilities there. So if there's any toilets, just letting know, people know exactly what's going to be there and being very precise about what is there and we'll come to that in terms of the, the toilets. Um, thinking about the terrain that you're going to, so it might be that it's a 10 minute walk in and you just need to provide that information, um, but also thinking about what does it feel like underfoot. So making people aware of the terrain, the distance, but also what's there being specific that there might be boulders the size of a fist um, or that you might have to step over boulders. Um, whether it's accessible while with wheelchair or not. Um, the third one there is timing. So what time of day and time of week it is, depending on who you're trying to, to reach. Um, so a lot of people, if they're worried about crowds in the week is better um, and just having a regular time commitment gives people that reassurance. The actual activity you're doing. Um, so thinking about if you need to take any extra items of equipment to support the activity and that links to the next one is do you need any adaptive equipment which sometimes could be simply the little fold up fishing chairs you get it's just that when you get to a spot people have something to rest on um, but just thinking about those items that you could bring and the next one is reaching groups which we found at able to adventure is the most important thing if you're trying to reach people of all abilities is actually talking about the fact that it is for them um, and finding their networks. A lot of them are Facebook groups, but there are other things that you can use and I'll come to those different groups kind of just further on. And the last one is transport, which is a big deal. Um, it's quite hard to get to areas in nature. And um, if people can't drive, which may quite often be the case, um, it's just checking what public transport there is or what transport options you can provide. Um, we actually have a wheelchair access vehicle so we can pick people up from having more train station and take them to locations and put their chair in the back or they can be transported in the chair. It's, it's up to them, but we have that option. Um, okay, so the next bit, inclusive equipment and approaches. So we've kind of talked about the planning before um, and you're at that point, you might know who's coming. So it's just kind of thinking about what you could bring to the session. We use off-road wheelchairs. We've got three different types. Two uh, can be pushed. Uh, another is a self-propelling and has e-power um, and is incredible. Um, one of them can go up to the top of Cairngorm Mountain, so it's got amazing uh, four wheels that go over big boulders. Um, so just thinking about, do you have off-road wheelchairs that you can use locally? I know RSPB Lot Garten have actually got one of the similar wheelchairs, so I do tell people that they can get around uh, Lot Garten and explore the reserve there. And then it's just thinking about if you are using their chairs or off-road wheelchairs that you can put a small sling on the front and that helps to just be able to pull up over awkward sections. If it's steep, you're better to turn someone backwards than you are to go forwards um, because you can use your body to brace rather than try and pull on the chair. So it's just simple techniques you can use. Active hands for physical activities. So if you're doing some tree planting or um, activities that involve using something that you have to hold, Active hands give you an extra grip so you can put the item in, whether it's a trowel, um, a spade, um, whatever it is they're using, then maybe having some active hands. And that covers a range of different uh, abilities, active hands. And then whether there is uh, an accessible toilet, which is the one that we generally know, or a change in places toilet. So a change in places toilet has a change in bed um, and a hoist, and that does mean an activity is accessible for everyone. So we had a change in places toilet at the race. Um, accessible toilet only goes so far and then it misses a range of um, abilities that wouldn't be able to come. Communication needs, this conference is a great example of that. We've got signers here. So just thinking about how we're communicating. Do we need more support? Do we need to make sure we're speaking slow and clear? Um, do we need more volunteers? You can just give that one-to-one -one kind of repetition. Um, and then that links to the last one, staff support for the volunteers. So do we need more, um, more volunteers to support the session? Have we noticed who's come in and that maybe we need a few more people? And then the last bit is really just speaking to the people who are coming. So giving them a chance to ask you questions um, and seeing if the individuals 
have any support that they think they'll need or anything they know of that they can share with you. Um, some people might bring their own stuff. I took a lot of different seats to a canoeing session and then the parents pulled out a seat I'd never seen before from the car and I just attached that to the canoe and that worked instead of my six ones I had in the back of my vehicle. So often speaking to others if you're running volunteering opportunities, um, if there's something that they want to bring, just so you're aware and also you can learn. It's really great to learn from them. Do tell me if I'm getting close on time so really that's got actually minutes. i've just popped your e message actually Gemma. that is you on on time okay. now so if it is possible to wrap up that would be great yeah yeah well that's a picture of the four wheel so there you can see it um it's really big um and then it's just a quick summary there of thinking about the language you're using um generally key for things being positive um and that you're willing and want to be encouraging of others and then you can follow able to adventure on twitter and on there, I've got a lot of the different channels that you could use to reach groups. So if you're looking to reach groups, you can see who I'm following and how that would help you reach groups for sessions. Um, and the last bit here, you're probably all aware of, but it's just thinking about when you're communicating to people, um, your text that you're using, your color contrast, your accessibility sliders, explanations of photos, and using capital letters in hashtags. I have to keep remembering that one. Yeah, break it up so people can see it. Um, and there we go. So that is our end photo um, of the guys at Lock Garten. I'm happy to uh, explain things that we've done if people want to talk to us directly um, and have any questions. So I will stop there so we don't run out of time. That Cheers. is really wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Gemma. Oh, I don't know what's going on there. A bit of um, uh, reverb going on there. So um, we have got one quick question from Joanna. Um, Joanna Todd is interested in, oh, it's just jumped down my screen. So Joanna's interested in the sort of approach you take Able to Adventure about contacting with different groups. So have individuals reached out to Able to Adventure or have you worked with the community to reach out to different groups? It's been a bit of both, actually. So um, it first started when I was at a climbing wall and I was working for someone else and I was working with these young people and a parent said to me afterwards, oh, um, you seem to be really good with our young people. Do you know much about them? I said, no, I don't know anything about them. She said, well, you seem to understand them. Why is that? And I just explained Able to Adventure and then she explained they're, they're autistic and she could see that I understood that and said, well, I'll link you into a Facebook group of homeschooled autistic children. So she, she then linked me. Um, so quite often it's people linking us, but a lot of it happens through Facebook groups. Um, so you really want to get to the bigger organisations first, like Scottish Disability Sport or the Disability Support Info Service, and then they'll link you to regional groups. Um, and then the regional groups will link you to a lot of the Facebook groups. There's a lot that happens on Facebook groups. So it is quite a lengthy process. Um, and I have noticed even now people still say, how do we find out about you? Why couldn't we find out about you? Um, and we've gone across all the national and regional organisations and you still have to filter down to the to the WhatsApp and Facebook groups that people seem to use because they get confidence from that. Um, so it is, it is quite challenging, but that would be my recommendation is trying to get to that level. Um, and there's a lot of groups by... Uh, condition and disability so trying to get to those specific ones as well okay thank you very much now again Gemma's going to be joining us for the panel discussion so any more questions that you have and um, then yeah that's um sounds like a, a great flow of how the panel will go there Gemma what we've just been talking about so break time tea break coffee juice water whatever um people so desire now We've changed track slightly. We're not going to have the quiz during the break because we don't want anyone to miss out and everybody's due their screen break. So we're going to do the next part of the quiz at 11.25 um, when you come back and that is us back on track. So if um, everyone could come back and we'll be starting promptly at 11.25. Thank you. So quiz part two. Recording in progress. So quiz part two and part three are coming now. So I will pass back over to Audrey. Hello everyone, hope you're feeling good after your little break there. Um, I'm just going to remind you 
about the quiz, how it works, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to offer you some different answers and you'll hear a few seconds of wildlife sound. And then you can select your answer on a poll that will appear on your screen. You just hover your uh, cursor over the right, well, what you think is the right answer and press enter. All of the images and sounds that you hear are coming from Ascent Field Club Archive today. It's a wonderful uh, resource and um, their website is on the chat room, so definitely look it up later. So let's get on to our uh, next question. Um, I'm going to ask you, and I would like you um, about the noise you can hear, where you're about to hear is a, a red deer stag roaring. At what time of year does it make this sound? Have we heard the sound? <gasps> oh, yeah, well, we have four options here. Is it spring? Is it summer? Is it autumn? Or is it the winter? Make your decisions now. And just to let you know, did you know it's only the male stag that actually roars? Um, as a matter of interest, I think we can go. Um, and I think Oh, it's quite interesting, actually, but actually uh, it is um, autumn and I think most of you have got that. Uh, a few of you have said spring there, but it is autumn and um, and it's quite interesting. I just wanted to tell you that the roar is used by males to hold a territory and to deter other lesser males and so helps to avoid physical confrontations. It also allows the females to judge the best quality of stag to mate with. So that's interesting. So I'm going to go um, on to our next question. Oh, <laughs> that is a magnificent sound. Um, so this is a uh, question three. Um, um, I'm going to just ask you what type of bird this is, and I'm going to give you some options. Um, but also you're going to hear a sound of the correct answer as well. Um, so is this bird a ring oozle? A. It is a golden plover. Plover. Sorry, I might have got that wrong. That's B. Is it a magpie, which is C, or is it a lapwing? And did we hear that sound? <gasps> oh, well, I have to say you're you're all a bit good at this actually, because um, yes. 62% have said the correct answer, which of course is D, which is lapwing. Um, and just a little interesting fact about uh, a lapwing, did you know the crest of the lapwing is when the bird is down, when it's on the ground, and it is down when the bird is up in the air. That's an interesting one. So we're going to go straight on to actually um, the next question. Um, we're just going to keep going. Um, Rosie, if you can put the next slide up on the screen. I'm just going to say while that's happening, I've had uh, zero questions correct. <laughs> so Rosie, far, I'm really impressed shocking. that everyone gets them all right. I know it's terrible. <laughs> um, now this one, um, this actual question doesn't have uh, a sound to it. And it's a very quick question. It's which one of these images, I mean, I will read them out, it's not a reptile. Is it A, the common lizard? Is it B, the slow worm? Or is it C, the palmate newt? And where are we going with this? Oh, nothing for A. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Mm, I think we've got a few experts in the audience today, actually, because I, I thought this was very, very tricky, actually. OK, I think you're right. It is. Uh, well, actually, neck and neck, B and C. I'm going to give you the answer. It's actually C. It's the palmate newt. It is an amphibian and the others are reptiles as they are both lizards. And going on now to our last question. Which, which does have a sound, as you can hear, actually. Um, collectively, these three groups of marine mammals are known as cetaceans. Uh, 
But which of the four cetaceans pictured is not, I repeat, not a resident of the west coast of Scotland? Is it A, the minke whale? Is it B, orca? Is it C, Rizzo's dolphin? Or is it D, the harbour porpoise? Oh, that's quite a tricky one. So the sound is the correct answer. So if you recognize that, that's going to help you get the right answer. Okay, where are we? Where are we? Oh, it's pretty even between A, B and C. A, B and C. Lots of people, I think more people are saying orca. And I just want to let you know that it's the minky whale. It, the answer is A. Um, so no, yeah, that was a little bit more tricky, wasn't it? And just something quite interesting about orca is it's the largest of the dolphin family and its unique dorsal fin can be two meters high, um, which is interesting. But thank you very much for taking part. I hope you've enjoyed it. And thanks again to the Ascent Field Club archive for uh, providing those images and sounds. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Audrey. And yeah, as you say, again, thank you for David for supplying that. And Joanna's popped a link to the field club in the chat. So head over into that link and, and check them out and get involved. OK, so um, we are now on to the workshop um, part, and that's going to be led by Jess from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. And also at the end of the workshop, we're going to be hearing from Erin Burke, the communications officer from Make Your Mark, who'll be telling us about the volunteer recruitment portal. So Jess is a discovery program manager at RZSS Highland Wildlife Park. The wildlife conservation charity is doubling down on making nature more accessible because people protect and value what they love and understand. Jess is developing both on-site and off-site activities to inspire and empower local communities to discover the wild wonders on their doorstep. So I'm going to pass over to Jess, who's going to lead the workshop about rebuild and adapt volunteer programmes in a post-COVID world. Thanks so much, Rosie. And Rosie B, if you're able to share my slides, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Just while we're sorting that out, everyone, now's the time for notebooks and pens. So at the ready, please. Thanks, Christian. Great. So yeah, and uh, if we skip forward a slide, because I'm aware that some people might have multiple pins, you can see a picture of me if I'm appearing very small or sort of pixelated in, in a corner somewhere. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much for the intro, Rosie. I'm Jess, I'm the Highland Wildlife Park Discovery Program Manager. Um, I've been in this role for just five months, uh, but I've worked at RZSS for five years this month. So uh, excited to have been here for a, a good chunk now. Um, I've been primarily based at Edinburgh Zoo before moving to the Highlands uh, this year. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be uh, moving up to Highland Wildlife Park. We're massively upscaling our community and our outreach programs um, and our facilities. So we're going to be building Scotland's Wildlife Discovery Centre over the next few months. And uh, this means that we're going to be able to deliver just so much more. Um, and that includes a huge refresh for our volunteer programmes. Thanks, Ravi. Next slide. So in today's workshop, uh, Rebuild and Adapt, volunteer programmes in a post-COVID world. We're going to take a quick tour through our site, Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park, to share just how and why we've used the opportunities presented over the past two and a half years to modernise, to upscale um, and just update really our volunteer programmes. So we're going to cover a quick welcome to RZSS. I'm sure most of you have heard of at least Edinburgh Zoo, but terminology around RZSS might be a bit confusing. Uh, we're going to talk about why now is the time for change and the opportunities that we've been able to capitalise on within the complete chaos. Um, a dive into the case study uh, of our volunteer programme from Edinburgh Zoo um, and then move on to some scenarios so that we can all share um, our experiences and learn from each other. You'll see throughout my talk that collaboration and being able to work with um, similar organisations and at the heart of that, that's just basically talking about nature connectivity. Collaborations with like-minded organisations have been really important, um, not only enabling us to do, deliver a lot more, but just in terms of staff support and making sure that we are looking after ourselves as well as being able to provide opportunities and look after people. Um, and that'll be the notebook bit there. 
Um, and then I'm just going to end on some really, honestly, very basic, but utterly invaluable advice that I've had regarding change management. And that really sort of underpins everything that we'll be covering today. Um, next slide, please, Rosie, thank you. So first of all, just a bit more context. So RZSS, that's the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. We're a wildlife conservation charity with two sites in Scotland, Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park. But our RZSS family spans right around the world via the 23 conservation projects that we either lead or contribute significantly to. Um, our vision is of a world where nature is protected, valued and loved. And so that needs an inspired and empowered worldwide community to join together. Making nature more accessible is fundamental because people protect and value what they love and understand. And we know that stronger communities have a greater capacity to care for wildlife. RZSS has just put together a new strategy actually. Um, and within that, we have pushed the importance of outreach um, and community right to the forefront. So alongside our conservation objectives. And by 2030, we've pledged to create deeper connections with nature for over 1 million people and enable more than 100 communities to better protect it. So from my perspective, it's wonderful to really have the support from you know, our entire leadership team right up to our CEO. And we're all equally um, aware of the importance of it. Um, Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park are our gateways to the natural world. So they help people to realise the mental and physical health and well-being benefits of being close to nature and help them fall in love with what's on their doorstep, as well as providing us with opportunities to link them to work that we're doing in countries like Brazil, Uganda and Cambodia that realistically most people are not going to be able to visit themselves. Um, and Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park are genuine conservation hubs for our national and international work. They host facilities like RZSS Wild Genes um, at Edinburgh Zoo, that's the only UK zoo-based conservation genetics lab, um, and projects like Saving Wildcats at Highland Wildlife Park, which is the first of its kind, um, and working to breed and release wildcats in Scotland. So bringing it back to today's theme, we like and we need volunteer support to bring that mission to life. Next slide, please, Rosie, thank you. Um, and I'm going to focus on those two sites and the volunteer um, opportunities that they provide today. So um, I'm actually going to get your pens and pencils and paper out now. Um, I'd, I'm just going to run through a, quite a brief snapshot of each site, and I'd like you to do the same for your site or your sort of primary site using those emboldened headers. So site size, biggest challenge, volunteer program status and number, and then your volunteer program highlight. If you're already running a volunteer program, um, choose something that you're doing or something you'd like to do. If you're in the early stages of setting up a, pro a program, it might be you know, the sort of reason that inspired you to go down this route. So for our two sites, yes, they are both united by a common RZSS mission and a shared staff body and structure, but in terms of visitor experience, expectation and volunteer opportunities, they're actually quite different. So Edinburgh Zoo, a historic, much loved city zoo with a global audience, um, thanks largely to a worldwide love of our giant pandas, Yangguan and Chan Chan. Um, Edinburgh Zoo is accessible, um, well linked uh, with public transport options, including an airport. It's very well connected to multiple um, urban environments and it has an established, if slightly outdated infrastructure. Um, the most obvious challenge that we face is the fact that we're based on a really steep hill, um, which if you've visited us, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, the views and the giraffes at the top definitely make the climb worth it, but um, in terms of accessibility, it definitely needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and I've also put managing resources as a challenge because as a city zoo, the level of interest that we, that we receive can push our team's resources to the limit. Um, which, while well, of course, is absolutely wonderful on many, many levels. It also means that we really need to be proactive in terms of recognising our parameters. We want to be known for quality rather than quantity. Um, we've had volunteers at the zoo for many years, and Ali Amaviska, who's our Community and Discovery Programme Manager at Edinburgh Zoo, um, says that Discovery Dens are her highlight of the programme, although she did say that uh, it was hard to choose just one. Um, discovery Dens are essentially sort of dedicated areas within the zoos uh, that volunteers are able to set up camps within. They can take along biofacts, um, games, and 
use that sort of space to interact with interested visitors and families during a visit to the zoo. So it took um, a real sort of acceptance from not only within our discovery and learning team, but from RZSS and the Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife teams um, to acknowledge that volunteers and the additional value that they could represent to visitors deserved this sort of earmarked space. Um, and then Highland Wildlife Park, so 100 miles and a little bit um, north is Highland Wildlife Park. It's a beautiful site, I'm not at all biased, uh, in the middle of the Cairngorms. Um, it's surrounded by wonderful panoramic views of quite a complex landscape, and we can use that to tell stories of Scotland's past wilderness, as well as sort of create inspiration and hope for the bright future that we hope that they hold. It's quite a different experience, and it's home to quite a different range of species. Um, all the animals at Highland Wildlife Park are cold adapted and suited for life in the Highland. Um, and the new buildings that we're in the process of constructing as part of uh, Scotland's Wildlife Recovery Centre will essentially completely redevelop nearly all the current infrastructure there. But until that point, we actually have very few indoor or sheltered areas and basically no paved paths. While we've hosted volunteers for many years there, it's been quite informal and on much more of a ad hoc rather than sort of recruited basis. Um, and although I'm going to be redeveloping that in the near future, we have had several highlights already. Um, one of the biggest successes and one that I can take absolutely no credit for uh, is a programme known as The Wombles. And it's my colleague, Jasper Hughes, who uh, needs a special shout out for that one. He's done an incredible amount of work um, working with The Wombles, uh, which is a wonderful partnership with a local group called Cabafe, and they support individuals with varied additional needs. And some members of that group have been coming to us for years and years um, as part of this collaboration. It's usually a few hours once a week, usually on a Wednesday, and the keepers will have identified tasks that they need help with. So it might be things like uh, clearing strips, browse from the reindeer enclosure. Um, and the Wombles have really proven themselves to be one of our most efficient squads, really. Um, and from an internal perspective, it's really required us to um, sort out our internal communication. And it now works wonderfully with our department working really closely with the keepers and with visitor experience as well. So it's a real highlight for all of us. Um, but as you can see there, a bit of a whirlwind tour, but hopefully you'll see that between the two sites, we have quite a broad range of volunteer activities and development potential. Um, and so hopefully you've got a similar sort of list for your site um, and how, uh, despite some quite logistical differences, there'll be common themes that help programmes develop and help us manage volunteers. So let's get stuck in. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Rosie? So, Time for change. I've put a question mark here, but really there's no sort of uncertainty. Now is the right time for change and the right time for a workshop like this. Um, in 2020, we were forced into change. Um, site closures, restrictions on group activities, social distancing, staff furlough. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting many more of those sorts of highlights. Um, but they made many volunteer programmes literally impossible. Um, many volunteering programmes, um, if not all, that required people to work outside of their homes had to completely pause or disappeared. Um, and the uncertainty that was sort of surrounding us within that period meant that organisations just couldn't even begin to organise or commit to hosting activities. And as traumatic as we all know that that was at that time, now, looking back on it, we can choose to build on the opportunities that this presents for us as volunteer managers. One of my personal favourites is that no longer can the reason, but this is how we have always done it, uh, justify any sort of inefficient or unwanted action. Um, and the staggered returns of people, of roles, of their activities, um, that second turn is still going on and it's clearly identified priorities and development needs. One thing that is really important to consider going forwards though um, is if or how relationships with our volunteer base may have suffered during this time. Updates may have been really difficult to manage as decisions, you know, we all know they were completely stop start for several months, if not years. Um, and extended cancellations may have resulted in people really um, becoming quite disillusioned, losing interest, essentially just, you know, life circumstances changing. So it's really important to have, keep momentum as we restart and to regularly check in and try to appreciate the perspective of our volunteers. A quick example here of um, Edinburgh Zoo, and I'm going to um, dive into a case study in a bit. But 
managing the return to site was quite a serious undertaking, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, many favourite activities, so things like delivering certain forks for certain animals, or really anything that kind of encouraged a crowd to gather, they just simply weren't possible. So supporting volunteers through this new normal um, began immediately on their return, and it changed the nature of the role for a while, and so it therefore impacted the volunteer expectation and experience. And this was quite difficult for us to manage. Obviously, it was complete unknown, but also quite difficult for the volunteers to sort of take on board what we were all wanting at, at that time. But, you know, it's probably still now is a return to the familiar, return to what we knew. And there were many things that just weren't even able to be discussed. Then. So explaining that to our staff, to our volunteers um, was a huge investment of time and it was definitely worth it. We'll skip on to the next slide, please, Rosie. Because um, it's really important to remember that with change, even with forced and uncomfortable change, there are opportunities. So to be super clear, it's far from change for change's sake. We are following the people and the evidence. Um, nearly half of adults, and this is uh, an English um, stat, but nearly half of adults in England report spending more time outdoors than before the pandemic. And close to four in ten say that nature and wildlife are more important than ever to their well-being. And um, the common reasons that people would cite when asked you know, about why they weren't volunteering within their communities were just tips on the head, you know, things like lack of time or um, sort of complete um, unfamiliarity with what it actually involved. They were just tipped on the head and um, drastically changed, first of all, during a period of COVID restrictions. But even now, we're finding that people have not lost that sense of sort of new priority um, for human interaction, for wildlife and for nature connection. So it's important to remember that despite the chaos, COVID gave us an opportunity to reevaluate, and in some instances it gave us the time to do so, and we could review things that we'd been doing for years just because we'd always done them. Um, and at the zoo, our most obvious example of this is the activity of grass rubbing, so kind of like colouring over a, a sort of sculpted thing underneath, and um, it was expensive to run, it was expensive to get the moulds, it was really time consuming. And at the end of the day, it had minimal conservation impact. We knew that volunteers loved it, particularly some of our longest serving volunteers. They really enjoyed it. But actually, we could see that they probably enjoyed it more than the visitors enjoyed it, particularly some of our younger visitors. Um, and we know that this activity doesn't really encourage repeat visits or improve conservation empathy. So when we came back to, to reinstating activities, it had to go. And this was a really hard thing for some volunteers, particularly, as I say, some of our longest serving volunteers to let go of. Um, and so that was quite a process for us as well to, to come um, to try to really appreciate their perspective with all of that and deliver it in a really sensitive way. Um, so let's dive into a bit more of a case study. So next slide, please, Rosie. Thank you. Um, so at Edinburgh Zoo already and coming soon to Highland Wildlife Park, um, COVID gave us the opportunity to really sort of reinvent our volunteer programmes. So to summarise it succinctly, um, we redid everything to focus on engagement and our engagement strategies. One of the biggest and perhaps one of the most obvious additions uh, is a much more proactive teaching of volunteers on how to best talk to the public about conservation, um, about RZSS and the RZSS mission, and about our animals and their role as ambassadors for um, their wild counterparts. By building in a framework to ensure there were repeat training opportunities, not just sort of one-touch inductions, we've been able to make all our volunteers feel supported and comfortable not just those who, rightly or wrongly, came in with a really high level of self-confidence. And after a period of COVID, this was really important because it wasn't just new starts. We needed to um, sort of retrain. You know, it's been a really long time, some of our um, original volunteers. And so this model worked really well because it wasn't threatening and it wasn't trying to teach them to suck eggs or question what they'd already done. It was a natural sort of self-development opportunity. So we have now two day long inductions and they're quite flexible. We do evenings or we do full days, depending on um, people's availability. And um, we offer shadow shifts to start with. We have a volunteer mentoring program where we let other volunteers take the lead role in training new starts. And that itself is a bit of a sort of badge of honor with some of our longest serving um, volunteers. Um, we have really regular volunteer recognition and celebration opportunities. So our biggest event of the calendar um, is our end of year appreciation dinner. 
Um, we were investing in back of house management, so we have formed for best impact. This is going to allow us to formalise management and recruitment. Uh, and we have a dedicated volunteer hub, so you can put regular updates in there. You can also have sort of libraries of historic resources, everything from sort of animal IDs and site FAQs to the weekly updated talk schedules and new requirements and kit, you know, where we are, it's largely rain jackets. Um, and all of this is because, as beautifully put by um, Ali, volunteers are extensions of us. We need to make them feel like they're part of the team because they are. Right, we're going to dive into some scenarios now. So next slide, please, Rosie. I hope you're already starting to identify ways where you either have um, or could maximise opportunities within your own programme. So whether you're looking at it from a management or participant perspective, really, um, hopefully you've already written down those kind of top line overviews of your site. Um, and we're going to work through three scenarios that should hopefully just inspire you to look a little bit further into ways that you can either grow your offering or the opportunities. Um, or um, here is a great way to start sharing things that you're already doing that you're super proud of. Um, I'm going to keep the scenarios really broad so that it's relevant to as many of us as possible. Um, and if you're already doing, you know, what you think your primary answer is, um, that's wonderful. Um, try to think of improvements on it if you can, but please then start sharing in the chat. I know time is against us a little bit on this one, and it would be great to get some dialogue going in the chat. I've already been so inspired by the talks we've heard of this morning. Um, so popping a few thoughts about what you're doing, who you are and where you're from would be great. Um, right, yeah, sharing back best practice is always wonderful. So firstly, accommodating different individual volunteer needs. So pens at the ready. Your scenario is, during your last recruitment drive, one or two individuals out of a cohort of 50 who have expressed an interest in joining have additional needs. There's no question on their passion or their motivation, but you know, in order to meet the requirements of the public engagement role that you're looking to fill, they will need ongoing support. What can you put in place so that you can welcome them into your program, knowing that both their needs and your needs will be met and hopefully exceeded? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to start writing. I'm going to give you a minute in total for each scenario. And I'm just going to um, pop in uh, some of our thoughts at RZSS about how we, we've done this within our program at Edinburgh Zoo. But I'll shut up for a little minute so that you can have some brain space to write. Right, keep on going. I'm just going to fill in a little bit with our um, Edinburgh Zoo uh, example. Um, and we've got a new group called Nature Connections. So it's a weekly activity session that ensures that we have given sufficient staff time to fully accommodate any additional support needs. This has enabled us to make sure that both staff and volunteers feel listened to and seen. And it really gets right to the heart of meeting different volunteers' individual expectations. So we anticipate that some volunteers may join these sessions just for a few weeks or months. Others may choose to attend these throughout their period of volunteering with us. Um, and our experience has shown that really we need to lean right into the requirements for additional capacity for sessions like this, not trying to modify an already existing structure. We need to dedicate proper time to make sure that we're enabling all our volunteers, regardless of experience, age, ability, the opportunity to join our community. It wasn't enough just to try and tweak our original plan for engagement volunteers. And we've already discovered that it's in a really positive position. And we've received good feedback um, and can already see our volunteer body becoming more diverse as we're able to recruit and then crucially able to retain individuals who previously would have become disillusioned, bored or lost from a more generic program that they would have been able to see um, that they just didn't think was meant for them. So have you all connected? Get a few thumbs up if you've written, if you need a couple more seconds, or if you've written a couple of lines for that one. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. We'll move on to scenario two. I know it's a whirlwind one, um, but keep sharing examples in uh, the chat, and we'll have time for hopefully a couple of questions at the end. Um, otherwise, I'll put my email in the chat and be more than happy to continue this conversation. So scenario two, identifying community needs. 
volunteer programs can contribute to vital community social responsibility work and impact a wide variety of stakeholders, including the general public, um, specific members of the community, partners, uh, members of the business sector and government. And looking at the situation we're in now, heading into winter with the cost of living crisis, this is going to be really important. So for this scenario, I'd like you to write down three steps that you can take to make sure that you're genuinely developing a suite of opportunities with the community and relevant groups. It's really important to ensure that we aren't guessing at wants and needs. So I'm going to give you another sort of couple of seconds to get started and then I'm going to give you a scenario with Highland Wildlife Park. So I'll be quiet for a bit now. So trying to write three things down. Um, and this scenario kind of summarises really where I'm at uh, with our volunteer and actually probably a bit more broadly with our activity programme um, at Highland Wildlife Park. It obviously ties in really tightly with meeting individual needs, but it's more about really how you undertake the classic kind of gap analysis to make sure that you're not going to be, first of all, shouting into a void and get no interest in your programme or your activity, or at the other end of the scale, just adding to the noise of an already catered for demographic. So this is where I begin to shout about the importance of collaboration. And we've looked at several already and I'm always open for more. One of my favorites so far has been working with the CMPA, so the Cairngorms National Park Authority group. We're really investing time in trialing resources and activities. Um, and we've also prioritized attending local events and actually just going to spend time in the communities without an agenda, speaking to people, groups, individuals, allowing them to voice their wants and their needs and crucially so that we can become familiar with any similar historic attempts whether they were successful or not and using that data to then begin compiling our plans. Now I'm going to power on through to scenario three. I hope that I'm giving you enough time to even just jot down um, rough bullet points um, but next slide please Rosie thank you. So recruitment style scenario three, and essentially you can read this out. How do you get off to the best start? Um, you've done the work with a program plan. You're confident you're meeting um, an identified communities and individuals needs. And now you're ready to open or expand the program to volunteers. But traditional recruitment avenues from advertisement to interview feedback processes can actually be quite restrictive. So how are you and your team ensuring that you aren't putting up barriers to your program. I'd like you to write, given time, maybe just one um, thought here um, as to how you are removing barriers within your recruitment process. Um, and as before, please do share in the chat. It'd be great to see some in the chat of those who have already started to make changes like this, or if you've heard of any resources uh, that you found really helpful. So I'll give you a couple of seconds. Wonderful. So I'm going to whiz through a couple that we're doing. Um, and uh, the biggest thing that we found really is sort of trying to remove hard deadlines and fixed application styles. So it can be overwhelming for, for any of us, um, but it's there's nothing worse than effectively having kind of countdown uh, ticking in the background if you're suffering through a particularly difficult period. So having more open volunteer windows or opportunities to express interest. Um, to allow people to sort of test the water a bit and then apply when they're feeling able to has worked really well. Um, online forms that can be easily input into sort of read aloud programs or software um, or allowing short video applications rather than lengthy written applications um, also allow people to very sort of with a very rudimental setup get either film themselves or have friends and family um, film their answers rather than needing to write them down. Um, we also try to do um, info sessions so that have absolutely no sign up implication or anything. Hopefully that takes some of the fear out of the unknown. Um, and while it, in, in the sort of industry that we're in, in terms of sort of public speaking and public engagement roles, there are a few um, opportunities like admin or um, research roles where it's not such a priority but being able to be a bit more flexible with group interviews or individual interviews and being led by individual preferences where you can is also a really good way to show um, 
that you're flexible and you're wanting to meet people on their best terms. Um, and on that note, it's also really important, obviously, to provide multiple and subtle opportunities for people to talk privately to you. You know, they don't want to come up at, at you at the front of a busy room asking for a, for a quiet word, but there's lots of opportunities, particularly within the recruitment process, um, where you can carve out time to learn how best to support volunteers who want to push themselves out of their comfort zone and know um, that there, there will be occasions where they find it hard. So um, I hope that you've managed to get a few things down there, but um, hopefully you've seen that these scenarios um, are really applicable across a really broad range um, of organisations. And hopefully they're helpful, even just sort of thought provoking points to help you to continue to build. Um, and I hopefully they make you feel really great about how much you're already doing and how much sort of resilience you have in place should it be needed. Um, the final topic, the next part of the slide, please, and um, that I just really briefly wanted to mention was change management. And um, as I said, we've all just come through an incredibly unsettled period. And um, so we shouldn't be numb to the fact that we probably, you know, reluctantly got used to rapid regular change, even if we still don't enjoy it. So don't take acceptance of change as being okay with change. We should all continue to actively manage how we introduce change into our volunteer program. And there's a really simple sort of four step thing that I try to keep in the forefront of my mind communicating often and communicating strategically, enough information but not too much. Acknowledge employees' feelings when managing change um, and uh, your volunteers um, as a, an extension of that. Um, and people will feel very differently. And sometimes the pace at which they will go through those, those emotions is sometimes rapid in itself. So being able to have opportunities that allow you to keep up with that is really important. Include people, invite them to help solve the problems that you're or the challenges that you're anticipating, and then follow through on plans promptly. Demonstrating action after an update is really important because there's often that initial sort of fear of the unknown or anticipation of the challenge of the change. Whereas if you can deliver a sort of update quickly followed by a change, hopefully the result will be that it's it's a nice sort of ease in rather than sort of letting the anticipation make the build up just seem so much worse than what the change actually is itself. And there's loads of online resources that you can look up to help drive change forward. And it's a great opportunity as well to provide opportunities for progression and development at an individual level if you have those people who you're wanting to step up or to take on more responsibility. Our volunteer mentoring program was an example of that. Um, and I think I'm just about to finish bang on the half hour mark, so I'm not sure if we have too many time, too much time for questions, but please do pop them in the chat. Um, I just want to say a huge thanks to Make Your Mark for having me today and to you all for joining and participating. I really hope that it's been useful. Um, and I'm going to pass on to Erin, who's going to talk about the Make Your Mark portal, which is a fantastic thing to be involved with and a great starting point for developing the collaboration we're talking about today. But thank you all. Thanks, Jess. Okay, can you all hear me and see the screen okay? Can I have a thumbs up from people? Okay, great. So uh, to introduce myself, I'm Erin Burke. So I'm the communications officer for the Make Your Mark campaign and my pronouns are they, she. So now that you've heard from Jess about revamping your volunteer program, I'm just going to speak very, very briefly uh, about how you can use our free volunteer portal to recruit volunteers. Our volunteer portal, which is accessed through our website at makeyourmark.scot, is both a volunteer recruitment and management tool. The portal has a variety of features to help volunteer organizers advertise opportunities, communicate with volunteers, recognize volunteers for their contributions and report on the success of your volunteer program. So the portal is very easy to use and I'll just give you a brief rundown of how to do that. To register your organization on the portal, all you have to do is fill out a very short form. So you can see that here and it just has basic information about your organization, like your name and your address. So pretty straightforward. And then once you're registered to add an opportunity, all you need to do is fill out another short form with details of that opportunity. So as you can see, it's very easy to use. And once your opportunities are approved, they'll be advertised alongside the opportunities of our other members. And this will form 
an online hub of heritage volunteer opportunities in Scotland. And we also help promote all of the opportunities that are uploaded to the portal. So you'll receive additional promotional support from us as well. We have a few top tips to help you use the portal. So firstly, don't feel like you have to use all of the features. Most of our members just use the portal to advertise their opportunities, which is done by filling out the two forms I showed you. And then once you're a bit more comfortable, you could try out the other management tools like logging hours or creating evaluation reports. The portal is designed to make your, it make it easier for you to recruit volunteers. So you can use as much or as little as you wish. Secondly, if you don't have any opportunities currently on the go, no worries, we'd still advise that you create a profile and add a general listing for volunteers to express interest for future opportunities. And so this will enable you to build a volunteer base for when opportunities do arise. Thirdly, know that there's a lot of support available. So on our website, you will find various tutorials to talk you through using the portal. And you can always email me at hello at makeyourmark.scot with any questions. And then finally, also on our website, you'll find other resources to help you recruit volunteers as well, um, such as a list of over 100 community groups and inclusion organizations and volunteer centers across Scotland, whom you can contact and partner with to reach new volunteers. So finally, uh, how do you get started? All you need to do is join Make Your Mark by filling out our expression of commitment on our website at makeyourmark.scot. And then you'll receive an email from me with links to the portal and also the tutorials that I mentioned. Joining the campaign and advertising your opportunities with us is completely free. And joining Make Your Mark not only gives you access to our volunteer portal, but also connects you to a Scotland-wide volunteer organizer peer-to-peer -peer support network. You'll also receive inclusive volunteer practice through our monthly e-newsletter and have the opportunity to celebrate the achievements of your volunteers by featuring them on our blog and social media. So thanks for your time today and I'll hand it back to Rosie now. Wonderful, thank you. And yep, thank you Jess for that workshop, really informative and inspiring. Thank you so much. And thank you Erin for um, your information there on our recruitment portal. Yeah, numbers are always growing. So please everybody do go over and put your opportunities on there. So next up, we have Alison from Nature Scott. So today, um, I mean, I find all these Make Your Mark Knowledge Share events exciting, but today is particularly exciting because it's the first mini conference we've had um, since the Make Your Mark campaign group grew to expand the collaborative reach with organisations who champion for natural heritage and the environment. So we warmly welcome Nature Scott, the Royal Zoological Society for Scotland and the Royal Society of Protection of Birds to the Make Your Mark family and the committee. So it's really great that we've expanded that, not just thinking about um, built environment, thinking about tangible cultural heritage, but also bringing that natural heritage side of things into Make Your Mark. So really great. Alison is Recreation Participation and Volunteering Advisor for Nature Scott, Scotland's nature agency. Nature Scott works to improve our natural environment in Scotland and inspire everyone to care more about it. So I'll pass over to Alison. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. So Nature Scott is delighted to be a member of Make Your Mark. Nature-based volunteering is new to Make Your Mark, but nature-based volunteering is well established in Scotland and we're hearing about some of that fantastic activity today. It is well evidenced that volunteering in nature is good for people's physical and mental health, and there are other reasons why it is so important. We've all heard of COP26 that took place in Glasgow in October 2021, this was an event to tackle the ch climate change crisis. I wonder if you have also heard of COP15. It will take place in Canada in December and will look to address the nature crisis. Yes, sadly, we have two crises to address, the climate emergency and biodiversity decline. We're going to show you a short film, just five minutes, to explain what COP15 is and why taking action for nature is so important. And we'll follow this with a survey to gather some of your thoughts on nature-based volunteering. And we hope that this will give us some ideas on future support needs and good example case studies. 
Thank you. So I think Rosie is going to share the video. You're giving yourself bad BO when you don't even realise. I've tried just about every traditional deodorant you can buy. Turns out most I'm sure you are all more than aware of COP26, the UN climate summit that happened at the end of last year. But do you ever wonder whether the world's leaders are taking the biodiversity crisis as seriously as they are the climate crisis? After all, scientists are calling this the sixth mass extinction. Biodiversity supports every aspect of our lives. Plants absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they produce the oxygen that we breathe. Microbes and fungi generate healthy soils and healthy soils help regulate the global carbon cycle. Rainforests influence global rainfall. Birds protect our crops from insect pests. Without biodiversity, we would have no society. We are part of nature and biodiversity is the very foundation of our lives. We are losing the world's biodiversity at an utterly alarming rate. A major report on biodiversity and ecosystem services published in 2019 found that one million species were threatened with extinction. The final text of the Glasgow COP26 climate deal emphasised the importance of protecting, conserving and restoring nature and ecosystems to meet the world's goal of holding global warming to 1.5 C. In other words, biodiversity is key to the climate emergency. The two are inextricably linked. So what is being done for nature and ecosystems? Well, later this year, the biggest biodiversity summit in the last 10 years will take place. After being delayed for two years due to the pandemic, COP15, the 15th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, will take place in Kunming City in China's Yunnan province. Governments around the world have become increasingly aware that healthy biodiversity, as with our climate, is crucial to human health, our economy and our whole society. We must transform the way we interact with the world around us. We need governments to lead the way in achieving this transformation. We need a blueprint for the way forward. Although the name COP15 is not intuitive, COP15 is the United Nations Biodiversity Conference. COP15 could be, and indeed must be, the defining meeting to ensure the future of global biodiversity and consequently the well-being of our societies. The COP15 summit will define the text of the global biodiversity framework, a framework that will guide global actions towards the hold of biodiversity laws, as well as giving hope to achieve the vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. One outcome should see countries commit to protect 30% of the world's land and oceans by 2030. Already, more than 70 countries, including the UK, have thrown their support behind this idea. Other commitments are to eliminate the discharge of plastic waste, reduce pesticide use by at least two thirds, and get rid of subsidies and incentives harmful to biodiversity by at least half a trillion dollars each year. Currently, biodiversity conservation is woefully underfunded, but the Kunming meeting has an ambition to raise the funds necessary to overcome financial barriers and secure a future for nature around the world. A commitment of an additional $200 billion each year has been suggested, but we're hoping for much more. Already, we're seeing calls from a number of countries to increase funding for biodiversity. China, Japan, the UK and the EU are all prominent here. It is also hoped that the meeting will strengthen and build on resolutions made at the climate summit, encouraging governments to increase nature's ability to store and absorb greenhouse gases in the form of nature-based solutions such as forests, seagrass meadows and peatlands. The Kunming COP15 aims to drive policies to restrict the destruction of natural ecosystems, prevent species extinctions and work with local communities to restore biodiversity and find solutions to the climate crisis. As well as transforming farming, forestry and other uses of the land and sea into nature regenerative practices. The Kunming COP15 has the potential to drive actions that will lead to massive benefits for biodiversity and our climate. 
So it seems the Kunming COP15 could be a major leap forward with the world's leaders coming together to address global biodiversity loss. The Global Biodiversity Framework is an acknowledgement that something needs to be done to protect and restore the world's biodiversity. But also an acknowledgement that something can be done. It's a global commitment for countries to work together towards the vision of us all living in harmony with nature. Thank you very much for sharing that, Rosie. And we've now got a, a short poll, just a few questions to um, capture some of your thoughts on um, action that we're able to take locally. I should also say they mentioned China and I mentioned Canada. That was because the COP15 was going to be in China and has now been rescheduled to Canada. So do we have the poll, uh, Rosie? So yeah, have you been involved with any volunteering activity to take action for nature or climate, just to see what you're all up to? And I don't think I can see the results, but we'll capture those so we could move. Oh, yeah, I can see the results now. So, yes, um, oh, great. 87% taking action and 13% hopefully being inspired to take action from today's events. And yeah, are you planning to take any action, a volunteering activity to take action for nature or climate? Good, 92%, well done, gold star. The other 8% we'll have to see if we can hook you in somehow. And do you feel well equipped to take action through volunteering for nature or climate? And if you're answering no, then we'd love to hear just a few words about what would help you to feel more confident and that's where the partnership and people here today we could discuss your answers and think about what action needs taken to help people have more confidence. And 92% uh, feel well equipped, so that's really good. And 8% need a little bit more help, so we'll have to, to um, get in touch and see how we can do that. And what would help you to feel more confident? To help for volunteering activity that takes action for nature or climate if there's anything specific that you think would be helpful. Although I'm sure a lot of the contacts and information that we've already had today will be helpful with that. And if you've got more to say, then there's time to put into the poll. Please put things into the chat um, or get in touch with us any of us um, following the session or we can pick things up from there also. And I think this is the last one. And it, do you have any examples of volunteer act activity taking action for nature and climate that would be of interest to others? And we're thinking particularly here of case studies. Um, Make Your Mark has some fantastic case studies on the website and is always looking for more. So keen to hear about any examples that you might like to, to cite. I think I've got a few in mind from what we've heard this morning already. Um, and if you do have examples, the second question is just if you're happy to be contacted 
um, with your contact details. But again, we can get them later if you run out of time to pop them in the chat here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alison. I think the easiest thing might be for folk to pop that in the chat, I think, with their contact details as well, with a wee bit of reflection during the panel discussion. Thank you. Is that the end of the poll? I think it is, yes. I'll hand back is to it? you, Rosie, and thanks everybody for your input to that. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see the results of all those polls, and I'm sure that we can um, share them with anyone that would um, like to see them. And yeah, lots of follow-up, I think, reading through the Nature Scott website there um, in terms of some of the um, strategies and such like that were mentioned. So this takes us on to the last part of the event now, which is the panel discussion. So we're gonna welcome back Julia, Laura, and Ali from TCV, Gemma from Able to Adventure, and we also welcome um, Holly from the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust. So Holly is a volunteering development officer for WWT in London, WT, WWT in Athrundel and in Welney. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing those correctly, Holly. I am very sorry. No she works problem. With, <laughs> she works very with southeast. Department. Don't worry uh, about it. <laughs> she works with heads of department at these sites to coordinate volunteer recruitment and management, covering all community-based project volunteering support for wetlands creation and solutions. So I was just about to say, Rosie B, if you can spotlight everybody, you have already done that. Fantastic. So please do put questions for the panel directly in the chat and we've got some questions that have already come through so this is a question for tcv when you have showcased and celebrated your project locally what's been the response from your community so i think um i would like to ask um julia or ali uh can you hear me Yes. Oh, phew. That's good. Um, so we run a lot of celebration events. So I'm not completely sure I would call them showcases, um, but we do celebrate what we do an awful lot. And when we do that with the communities that we were talking about earlier, um, it goes down extremely well. Um, it grabs attention and it's a way of kind of sharing. Um, we, as I said earlier, we, we tend to um, try and find ways to find things in common so the food the celebration um is is kind of like a key way of doing that and it's something that we're taking forward into our next program so um our communities absolutely love to come together uh, sometimes in huge numbers and sometimes in quite small numbers and when that happens um we get a lot of very good feedback ali i don't know if you want to add to that from your experience um, yeah, indeed, uh, we did the uh, outdoor cooking and people loved it. Uh, I think uh, everyone enjoyed it. Uh, our numbers like doubled at the day of the of the outdoor cooking festival, uh, or I think it was the refugee festival or something like that. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not sure, but people love love this uh, kind of event, and this is yeah something uh, we hope that we could do more and more. Uh, yeah, that's from my side. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, question for Gemma. So COVID-19 has resulted in an increased awareness of informal and formal volunteering in local communities. Do you think that there needs to be more done to support nature-based volunteering? Oh, right. Um, I mean, if we're talking about people of different abilities, Yes, I do think that needs to be more done and I am seeing more being done, such as the, the off-road wheelchair at Lock Garten and just the um, interest and support that we got from um, RSPB for the young people. They, they gave the time of their staff and they made sure that we could access the facility. So I do think more can be done. The hardest thing, um, I think, as I said before, is is reaching people and giving them the confidence that they will be supported. But I am noticing more people reaching out to us, especially landowners and organisations, to try and reach the groups that we know. So I think it is moving forwards, but it's it's slow because 
yeah, we have to get to those individuals and groups first, which is quite challenging. Um, yeah. And do you think that there's any key organisations that sort of thinking about intermediaries, national organisations um, that do provide this support that, uh, you know, participants here in the event could kind of reach out to? Yeah, um, that's actually a big challenge. Um, so we're noticing as a small organisation, there is um, no direct kind of disability organisation you can go to. Um, there are a few reliable places such as Ewan's Guide that disabled individuals talk about um, and do use. There's a Disability Information Service Scotland, um, but when we visited their page, it was very out of date. Um, so yeah, there isn't, there isn't, and that is our challenge. We are trying to network people and bring together that point. And we've asked families, where do you go to to find the information? And most of it, unfortunately, is word of mouth. Um, and, and through groups. So I think that is a current challenge is finding something reliable um, that people can go to. Um, and we haven't found it, unfortunately, at the minute. So we have to go specifically to disability organisations and then break it down regionally and then break it down again mm -hmm. to find out who's in that area and get connected. So the only thing I can recommend at the minute is you start at the national, break down to the regional, and then you'll break down to even smaller groups. Uh, and through that, you get massive loyalty. That is the big thing I've noticed. We get people coming back again and again and again um, because they build that confidence in you. So I'm sorry, there's not a place to direct you to. I really wish there was because we would go straight there. Um, but um, yeah, just go national and break down to your region and then get your contacts from your region and then they'll break it down again. And as soon as you meet anyone, just ask them, is there anywhere I should be talking to um, to reach more people? And the word of mouth seems to boost things massively. Okay, thank you. It's really good. Really good takeaways there. Um, so next question that we have for Holly, um, and this is about um, attracting and retaining talent into organisations um, in terms of supporting volunteering. So do you feel that natural heritage organisations, and maybe taking examples from your own practice, are missing anything when it comes to attracting and retaining um, young talent in terms of kind of success, thinking about succession planning and, and growing volunteer programmes? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> That's a very basic answer. Um, I don't know if anyone else saw it, but there was an article this week in The Guardian that clearly shows that those who've signed up to um, diversify their, their, both their staff and volunteering in the conservation sector, so we're not doing enough in terms of inclusion, and that certainly includes young people generally and particularly young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds or communities with lower engagement within our sector. Um, I, you know, really pick up on the point that uh, Jess made, you know, how this is how we've always done it. And it's, that's certainly something that needs to be dismissed. Um, we know that younger people generally are making decisions based on values where they can. Um, so there's a massive opportunity there. I'm, I worry about how much we place additional practical barriers in the way. So partly money, partly physical access. Um, certainly for us, um, our sites are usually fairly remote and you need to be able to drive to them. And Claverock is a prime example in Scotland. Um, and of course, our resource and internal pressures make it really hard for a manager to take a step back and think how they're going to make that effort to attract and support someone who may need and demand more of their time. Um, I think in order to combat that, we have to make it a strategic priority. And that is something we, we as an organisation are beginning to do. Um, in the past year, we've really kind of stepped up in looking at how we can make our placements uh, accessible. So when I talk about placements, we talk, we're, we're looking at those who are taking um, a sandwich year out to gain that practical support. Um, up until this uh, spring, we did not offer as an organisation any volunteer expenses at all, apart from those expenses that had been agreed with a staff member in advance. So we are now offering either accommodation or we are offering um, travel expenses to a certain point 
for our placements and we're using um, discrete projects to give a really good case for our management board as to why we should be offering travel expenses across the board. Um, and similarly, we're now looking at cost of living expenses for our placements as well. Um, and I think just simply offering that and making things more accessible enables us to be able to implement that through a bit of cultural change, that practical tools and support is something we, we really miss, I think, sometimes. Um, yes, I don't know if there's anything else you want to ask me about that on there. No, no, I was just listening to that and, and reflecting, I think, um, yeah, I think that that's a similar journey. And, and yeah, the past couple of years really is sort of shaking things, thinking about, um, you know, in, inclusion and equity, etc. It's not optional anymore, um, you know, and, and that's got to be kind of uh, the way forward and picking up on Jess's points as well about, um, yeah, the changes that have to be embraced if we can't go back to how it was. Um, yeah, and again, that's not to go back to them, but the, the Make Your Mark workshops that we'll be talking about really at the core of that is yeah. about tackling barriers and, and trying to make change across the, the sustainable um, change across the sector. Um, I've just checked, just thinking about the time, the event is due to finish now. So I just want to say if anyone else needs to go, so we'll go for about another five minutes. If anyone needs to go right now because of 12.30, thank you so much for joining us. If you've not joined Make Your Mark, please do join. Head over to the work, uh, the Make Your Mark website to get information about the workshops we were talking about. The portal is all there and get in touch with us. Um, so just, um, we have got another question, uh, TCV. Um, so one of the best online resources to upskill yourself in areas relevant to nature-based um, volunteering, working with people from um, minority ethnic backgrounds, because the understanding I think is TCV have got some resources available. Is that right, Julia? Did you sorry? Did you say online, um, Rosie? Um, online resources, if possible. Yeah, that's what the question we, was. We do have some online resources, and we do have some training courses which are migrating online um so we, we've got some face-to-face -face training and and some kind of like work in progress moving towards online training but we also offer our organizations a chance to shadow what we do as well so because we are firm believers in this area that that hands-on and and shadowing and coming along and seeing how we do things is is, is really valuable um, and and it, I don't know, there's something about human contact in this particular field that I think is really important. Um, and not everyone can do that if you're in different parts of the country. So I appreciate that's not always the easiest thing. Um, because this can be a challenging area, um, we, we do find time and again that virtual contact at, at, the, at the outset can really be quite difficult. And actually, the, the, the closer you get to the person you're trying to... Um, work with be that a partner organization or an individual um, the better so you know uh, emails quite often don't work for example and phone calls so so just a general kind of point is e either working with a partner organization and getting face to face is is kind of one of the key things it's it sounds simplistic but it take it saves time just to get as close to where whoever you're wanting to position position yourself with the better and and, and actually we do um, work in partnership with a whole load of different organizations as a way um, to getting to the target audience, be it somebody with a disability or children with ASN, or in our case, I didn't mention this earlier, but we're working with gypsy traveler, young people. So we tend to go straight to the organization that is working in the community, perhaps on a completely different field first, we'll partner with them and then that's a way to fairly quickly meet the groups that we're trying to get in contact with I hope that makes sense so that yeah. I didn't really answer the question of online because there are so many different ways of of getting to where you want to be okay thank you I'm not sure Holly were you going to come in on there and say anything um no I, I was simply kind of trying to there's something else that kind of connects with that um, the, the reach um, we and we've realized that the we've been so site focused we have 10 sites across the UK and we've been so site focused that the kind of that community reach is becoming and the partnerships becoming all 
or more important, but setting up specific projects that can focus on specific areas to bring those people in and just have create a connection more than anything else. And that is something that is very much more um, organizational wide, not just focused purely on, you know, the responsibilities on the volunteering team to do that. I think that's uh, something we need to keep in mind is that there needs to be an organizational focus around that. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, Gemma or Ali, is there anything that you'd like to add to the discussion that we've been having? Uh, not from my side, thank you very much, no, sorry. Okay, thank you. Gemma, anything you want to add? Hi, um, yeah, I was just trying to think, my head's been connecting to lots of different things and there's definitely um, folk that I will email about possible um, young people that I work with up here in the Kangons and um, volunteering that they, they want to do. But um, yeah, just to say that people are welcome to get in touch with myself if they want to discuss anything um, in terms of the inclusivity and any um, equipment that you recommend. There are a lot of off-road wheelchairs around Scotland that are available to use. So if that comes up within your volunteering, then um, I could signpost you to where there would be one close to yourselves. Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay, great, thank you. So that takes us to the end of the panel and then to the close of the event. So I do just want to share um, some up and coming activity with you that we are doing in Make Your Mark. So. With support from the Scottish Government, Make Your Mark is offering a programme of free workshops on developing inclusive volunteer programmes by identifying and addressing barriers to engagement. Over the next six months to March 2023, 10 volunteer involving organisations will have the opportunity to work with inclusive recruitment specialists from AAI Employability. Partnerships will be supported to develop inclusive volunteering action plans to address values, assumptions, policies and practices that may be excluding people and reinforcing inequality. So for more information about the workshops and how to express your interest in participation, please head over to the Make Your Mark website. So there's a link there in the chat. Um, there isn't long, it's 10th of October, we're hoping to get all the expressions of interest in. So if you've been part of this event and you're keen please head over now. You can express your interest and then sign up for Make Your Mark. Um, that's okay, don't worry about that. If you know any organisations that you think would be keen, please just take the time to share it with them. That'd be great. And um, as I've said, we are looking for heritage organisations and non-heritage organisations to work together on this. So thinking about your networks, spreading the word, and it's a free opportunity funded by the government. Um, so uh, yes be great to have you all take part in that. Thinking about um, upcoming events, so the next Volunteer Organisers Network, which is a partner with Make Your Mark, and that's a peer-to-peer -peer support network for volunteer um, organisers. Again, another great reason to join Make Your Mark is to join the network. So their next coffee morning is on Thursday, the 3rd of November from 10 to 11 a.m. And then the next Make Your Mark mini conference, we will be back in December. And that is about exploring um, class inclusion in heritage volunteering and all of the barriers associated around that. And so we've got some great speakers already lined up. We do still have a couple of slots on the agenda so please follow up um, to hello at make your mark if you think you'd be interested in speaking um, at that or have a suggestion of a speaker we could reach out to and that's going to be on Thursday the 7th of December Christmas jumpers are encouraged but optional I will be wearing my hat so a recording of today will be uploaded to the make your mark website a digital feedback form that will take five minutes ish to fill in will be emailed after your to the event and um, if you've got time to do it we'd really like to hear from you just so we can make sure that we keep these knowledge share event programs on track and um, with useful content so i just want to um say thank you to everyone that's been involved and um, fellow team members jess christian joanna allison sarah erin audrey tamsin and our community connections forum tech extraordinaire rosie b also our bsl interpreters sharon and donna and again and um, thank you to david for supporting us with the quiz content today so that just takes me to say thank you and bye for now